Cool. I'm uh, Kyle McDonald, and I'm coming from Los Angeles via Seoul, Korea, and... I'm Alex Taylor, coming from London. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about myself. I think Kyle's going to start. Yeah. And thanks to Bomb for having us. This is cool to be here. It's nice to visit Birmingham for the first time for me. And I think you, you said you've been here before. You've already had the Baldy. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is sort of the outline of what we're doing. It's going to be a little long, but there's going to be that break in the middle for the, for the food. And uh, we've got kind of two challenges for everybody. So this was originally pitched to us as like a workshop, but we weren't quite sure whether to make it more of a workshop or a talk. So we found something kind of in between. So at some point, you're going to be expected to get into small groups of three or four people and come up with some responses to uh, some things that we throw at you. Um, if uh, you cannot understand my thick American accent, <laughs> let me slow, just tell me to slow down or clarify. I feel OK with people like raising their hands or whatever, just shouting. You know, We're very familiar in the US with shouting, so uh, I won't be offended. Um, yeah. A little louder. Uh, all right, great. I'll use my American voice. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to, this first chunk is going to be the longest. We're going to talk about intelligence a little bit, kind of generally. I've, I'm, I've got a few more words to say than Alex uh, at this point, not because I have any more insight more or... <laughs> Anything, but uh, I just prepared more slides than he did. So <laughs> let's let's get into it. Um, all right, this is my section about me. I'm going to give you a quick intro to Kyle. Uh, I like I said, I'm an artist. There's some chairs over here, and uh, I spend a lot of my time asking questions. I tend to jump between tools and fields of research, uh, exploring different possibilities of each technique. Um, or uh, kind of following these techniques to discover new questions. Um, in 2009, I was really interested in 3D scanning. Uh, it turns out with really basic hardware, you can build a 3D scanner just with a camera and a projector uh, plugged into a computer. So I built one, and uh, I put the source code for it online, and people started making music videos, and I made dance movies with friends, and. That was really exciting. That gave me some kind of idea of like what was possible with open source tools. Um, before that, I thought that anything that was like high tech had to be provided by a corporation. But I, at that point, I felt like okay, we can like take a step ahead of people. Um, uh, every time I learn something from working on one of these tools, I come up with kind of new ideas that I wouldn't have thought of without having had done that kind of technical research. So this is a video from a project called Light Leaks um, from 2013 with Jonas Yang. Uh, we used a bunch of mirror balls, about 50 mirror balls on the floor and three projectors, and we scanned all of the reflections on the walls so that we could locate them in 3D space and use it like a big LED display. Um, and uh, that's uh, an idea I would not have had if I wasn't working on 3D scanning before that, because it turns out that scanning technique, the only way to really do that without spending days clicking on pixels is to use this kind of computer vision technique that's used for 3D scanning. Uh, in 2011, I started working with face tracking, and I made a tool called FaceOSC, uh, which I really says this app for people to kind of get data from their face and plug it into synthesizers or other apps that they were working on create their own experiments. And uh, that also gave me some other ideas that I worked on with this guy, Arturo Castro, who's, who was at the top left a moment ago. Um, we developed this technique that we call face substitution, which now is called face swapping, uh, because we did not patent it and have any control over how it was used. Um, but that was 2011, and uh, this is another thing. Like I wouldn't have thought of substituting faces if it wasn't for playing with these face tracking tools. So recently, I've been doing a lot of stuff with machine learning. Um, and this has brought me to ask a lot of questions about what it means to be intelligent and uh, whether computers can be intelligent and uh, how that is impacting society around us. Um, so 
So let's talk about what human intelligence looks like for a second. Intelligence can mean a lot of things. When we say that humans are intelligent, uh, we're usually referring to this big collection of abilities or behaviors we have. And Alex and I are going to say some of the same things, I think, around intelligence. Um, we're going to give like our own spin on it. Um, we, had, we talked about this a lot, and uh, um, it turns out like we're kind of aligned in a lot of ways. So hopefully we don't repeat each other too much, <laughs> but I'll give my version quickly. Um, so I think we're normally referring to like a big collection of abilities or behaviors, things like constructing explanations, remembering things, answering questions, making predictions, etc. cetera. Um, we're familiar with all these things in our everyday life, and intelligence isn't just one of these things, it's not all of these things. Um, each of these things is a kind of intelligent behavior. We can see these in other entities and systems around us. Um, even uh, when we think about where intelligence comes from in humans, it's kind of ambiguous. We like to think that like it's here, you know, it's kind of in this area, somewhere inside our head, but um, it's actually kind of difficult to locate intelligence in humans. Um, yes, like this is the center of our nervous system, but um, there's some examples of uh, uh, doctors who have worked with patients where they are otherwise normal, but then they do an MRI scan and it turns out they mostly don't have a brain. Like this was a, this was a French dude who went to the doctor because he had some uh, troubles feeling his leg one day. He was, you know, in his 40s and uh, totally normal um, civil service worker. And uh, they said, oh yeah, uh, this cerebrospinal fluid since you were a kid has been swelling up to the point where your brain is basically non-existent. It's just around the edges of your cranium. Um, yeah, so I, there's cases like this where it's not really clear anymore, like what? Where is human intelligence? Is it maybe more in our social interaction? Is it in the way that we're embodied? Is it how we uh, talk? Is it something about language? Is it about representation? Um, not, not totally clear. So I'd like to propose intelligence can take a lot of other forms besides what we're familiar with from our everyday life. Um, and uh, it can involve other behaviors as well. Um, so the same way it's difficult to pinpoint intelligence in humans sometimes. I think it can be difficult to locate intelligence in other complex systems. So I want to give an example of uh, another weird complex system involving human intelligence. This is a screenshot from a website called Mechanical Turk, which was built in 2005 by Amazon. Um, and they were trying to create a platform for, to kind of mine data from human intelligence. So at the time, we didn't have any uh, we didn't have any algorithms that could answer questions about things like, you know, what a picture contains. In 2005, we didn't know how to answer that question very well. Um, if we gave a picture to a computer, all it knew about was the pixels and maybe the brightness and some blob detection or something. But it couldn't tell you that's a bagel, that's a Dalmatian, um, that's a Range Rover. Uh, it just knew that there were some red pixels or green pixels or kind of shape going on there. And Amazon decided that if they were going to make progress on these kinds of tasks, they were going to need to collect a lot of data um, from people. So what happens on Mechanical Turk is that you get paid as a worker on Mechanical Turk a few cents uh, to do something really mundane, but something that you're really good at as a human, something that a machine would be really bad at. Uh, in this photo, there's a lot of examples of um, like labeling receipts, because it turns out doing OCR on receipts is still difficult, and a lot of people find it very valuable, where they just want to scan in a bunch of receipts and get kind of automatic um, uh, annotation of what's going on there. And even to this day, there's hundreds of thousands of people actually working on Mechanical Turk doing labor throughout their day to basically make just under minimum wage doing these kind of simple tasks. Um, so uh, I wanted to give an example of this project from artist Lauren McCarthy, who used this kind of crowdsource intelligence to upgrade her dating life. This is a project called uh, Social Turkers, and I'm gonna talk over it a little bit. Um, so for a month, uh, she went on a new date every night uh, using OkCupid to find her dates. Um, she visited a city that she hadn't been to before, so she wouldn't run into like, anyone she knew. Um, <laughs> 
she was living in Boston at the time, and she went to Portland, so on the opposite side of the country, just to try this out. Um, and then she would take her phone and she'd kind of put it in the corner of the table like this, without telling her date what she was doing. And what she was doing was she was streaming the date over video to mechanical turf workers um, for them to give her feedback on how to have a better date. So they would go to her website, fill out this form, and you know, say, you should do this differently, you should do this differently. They give her sometimes specific advice, like tell them a secret, or have a bit more excitement and interest. Um, and then every few minutes, she would get kind of a text message on her phone that had a summary of what her advice was. And she got better and better at um, going on dates over the course of a month. She didn't really find true love, but uh, <laughs> she learned a lot. And actually, that's how I, um, I met her through this project, and we got we got married about a year and a half ago. <laughs> I wasn't one of the dates, but uh, I was one of the mechanical Turk workers. <laughs> so uh, recently, more recently than that project, we worked on this project called Noodle. Um, so Social Turkers, I think, was 2013. Noodle was 2014. Um, in Social Turkers, she was asked, acting as like a body for this crowdsourced intelligence, right? They were kind of making decisions. It's kind of ambiguous, like who's the intelligence in that case? Like, is it her? She's acting things out pretty directly, or is it the kind of crowd who's making actual decisions and observations? Um, I'm not sure, but we decided we would build a kind of com computational body, a little robotic body for crowdsourced labor. Um, so we made this box called Noodle, uh, which uh, had a camera in one eye and a microphone in the other eye, speakers for ears and a small screen on top, and had a wireless connection to the internet. So once you put Noodle down in some space, it would connect to the network, and if you went on your laptop or your phone, you could fill out this form that basically says, it's kind of like writing a little letter. You say, okay, Noodle, when the audio detects a loud noise, first use the camera to take a photo, and each of these things were drop downs that you could click on and kind of fill out what you wanted it to do. It was like a natural language way of writing a program for Noodle to execute. But there was one really important part where it says, decide to answer the short answer question, please describe this scene, or is this person scary? That's something that right now we still don't have a good way for a computer to do that, right? Some of those things we're starting to have answers, like what's in this scene, or um, you know, is this a situation involving violence? Like that, We actually have algorithms that can determine some of those things. But um, there's a lot of this we still don't know how to do. So that's the part we farmed out to Mechanical Turk. Um, and it became this kind of body for this crowdsourced intelligence to act through. Um, I think every day we see more and more questions being answered by machines, and sometimes they're even really important questions, like you know, asking a car to decide who it should save in the case of an accident. Um, it seems like we still need humans in the loop somewhere there, but um, there's a lot of questions to figure out. We don't have good answers for them. Uh, some other artists have worked with Mechanical Turk to develop intelligent objects with a specific goal, like Descriptive Camera by Matt Richardson in 2012. Um, in this project, the camera sends a photo to Mechanical Turk to get a description from someone on there and prints it out on this little receipt printer. <laughs> so developing means <laughs> someone is writing something right now. <laughs> Or this project, 10,000 Cents, from Aaron Koblen and Takashi Kawashima. They divided up a US $100 bill into 10,000 pieces, and then asked people on Mechanical Turk to recreate each piece by hand by drawing it. So people got paid one cent to draw this little square. Um, you could say that with this project, um, it involves the perception of a kind of crowdsourced intelligence with thousands of pairs of eyes. That's one way I like to think about it. And there's this piece in the back there that I have as part of this uh, exhibition right now called Exhausting a Crowd, um, which was based on a book from Georges Perec uh, from 1974. He sat on this bench in Paris for three days and just wrote down everything he saw that was happening in the space. So the rain gets fierce. A lady makes a hat with a plastic bag marked Nicholas. Uh, some green emerges from a shopping bag. The church square is almost empty, three people cross it, an apple green car, a 96 bus. He really liked writing about buses <laughs> and uh, taxis. And, uh, one of the lessons I, 
I learned from reading this is that it's really impossible as a human to avoid categorization. That's like part of how we perceive the world around us. Um, but then at the same time, even though he went into as much detail as possible, uh, there's so many things that are lost that we'll never understand. And we're fundamentally seeing it like through his perspective. Um, I kind of mashed up this old idea of like what it looks like to be a human in a space writing literature with this new idea of like crowdsourced intelligence to make exhausting a crowd where in London for 12 hours we recorded a video in Piccadilly Circus and then posted it online with the ability to kind of leave notes on the video. Um, and uh, people leave all kinds of notes with interesting stories like Sometimes they're just about surveillance, basically, like, here's a car running a red light. Um, but most of the time, it's pretty surreal, like, absurd observations. I'm actually a black hole sending rubbish to other dimensions where it's properly recycled and reused. Um, it's this way, laddies. <laughs> Irish band that got lost on their way to the pub. There's a lot of funny little things in here. Balloons for someone's 50th. I would never notice most of this. It's like such a small excerpt of a small portion of the corner of the video, and they found it anyway. Or there's these more melancholy moments. <laughs> <laughs> there's like two people riding the bus. <laughs> so we can die. Um, this is one of my favorite sequences, so I'm just going to narrate this uh, quickly. It was uh, the initial kind of big. The beginning of this sequence was added really early in the project by a few different people. Um, and uh, slowly over time, more and more people added notes that uh, kind of continued the story. So the bottom, and then, so then I says to Mabel, Mabel, wait, look over there. This is a couple here. Kiss me, you fool. This guy runs across, gotta pee. <laughs> what, right here, right now? Yes, kiss me right on the lips. Couple kissing. Get her back in the flat. <laughs> Do you think anybody's recording us? <laughs> okay, and you can't even see it on this projector. It's kind of amazing. He basically has his hand like right here. Look at this place like a gentleman. Right? Hand place like a gentleman. Couple kissing. And you can't even see it, but he just moves it a little lower, and it says hand lower now. This is the smallest of the smallest detail. I can't even imagine having caught this myself, but somehow with this kind of crowdsourced eye, we get this new story about what happened one night in London at 3 a.m. when no one thought anyone was watching. Um, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to continue here. Okay, so I'm, I'm already... Let's talk about some weird kinds of uh, machine intelligence that have popped up in the last few years. Uh, I would say one of the things machine intelligence excels at right now is imitation. Uh, a lot of recent developments are based on this technique called deep neural networks or neural nets. Uh, in this example, a neural net has been trained to imitate uh, the style of a painting. At the top center, you can see there's this starry night version of the photo on the left. And it feels like this kind of thing should be impossible. Like a computer shouldn't be able to do this. A human should take years to study, to produce something that's like a proper imitation. But um, it turns out that imitation is uh, something that computers can be pretty good at if they just have enough data. <laughs> that's kind of what they're designed for. It's repeating something based on what they've been given. They can imitate text too. It's not just constricted to or restrained to images. In this example, there's this uh, AI researcher named Andre Karpathy who is trying to imitate um, text from, you know, if you have a megabyte of text, then can you produce something that looks similar? Um, so here he's imitating Shakespeare. Oh, if you are a feeble sight, the courtesy of your law, your sight in several breaths will wear the gods. With his heads and my hand are wondered at the deeds. So drop upon your lordship's head and your opinion shall be against your honor. <laughs> it sounds really like Shakespeare, right? But it doesn't have any significance. <laughs> it doesn't really work. It, it, it picks a character and it says something in their voice, but um, it doesn't have any larger structure. I think that might be temporary, though. I think a lot of researchers are trying to figure out how to make more global, coherent structure for these um, uh, 
uh, kind of creative intelligences. They can also imitate speech. Neural nets can imitate speech. So here's an example from uh, Google DeepMind trying to speak without being told what to say. Mm -hmm. That's like what a computer thinks English sounds like. They can also imitate speech from a specific person. So this is an example from this year, spoken using my voice. Neural nets can also imitate speech from a specific person. This is an example from a company called Lyrebird, spoken using my voice. <laughs> Besides imitation, I'd also say uh, machine intelligence itself excels at answering questions. We were having a kind of discussion about this earlier, about um, uh, how answering questions is kind of like a weird thing that humans do, and it's strange that we ask computers to do this for us. Um, but I think this is one way of framing a lot of tasks that we've solved with machine learning in the last few years. So the questions can be really general, like what's in this picture? Is it a leopard, a mushroom, a cherry? This research was published in 2012, and it was a huge breakthrough. It was the first time that this kind of uh, object recognition was possible. Or they can be more specific, like how do you describe this picture? two dogs playing in grass, a group of young people playing a game of frisbee. So a few years after, researchers figured out object recognition. Now they're already going on to full sentence descriptions. Um, and then later that year, they're asking really specific questions, like how many boats are visible, or is this photo taken in Antarctica? Um, some of these algorithms run backwards, like this one is generating a picture of a church steeple that has a clock on it. It's not exactly right, but I can kind of see the connection there. Um, some of these algorithms will run in real time. So this was me in uh, Amsterdam, I think, two years ago. And <coughs> I was here. So I'm just kind of walking around and just labeling the world around me. But I want to skip to this one point where I'm over here and these guys are like looking at me, because you have to imagine I'm walking around my laptop like this, right? And these guys are like, wait, what does that say on there? Because they can see the video of themselves. It's, uh, it's trying to figure out uh, yeah, who you are. Man, man, holding your own What? <laughs> So with all these breakthroughs in machine learning, it can be easy to get excited about all the possibilities for machine intelligence. Um, when it seems like the pace of research is speeding up uh, every year, we have to wonder what's going to happen next. This is a picture from uh, Google meeting the Go, one of the Go masters of the world, Lisa Dole. Um, I think that was last year, yeah, March of 2016. And some people are really worried about machine intelligence becoming dangerous in the near future fears of super intelligence or uh, you know, killer robots. Um, but I think those fears are kind of escapism. Uh, I think worrying about super intelligence or killer robots is a way of avoiding more difficult discussions that need to happen right now. Because um, when decisions are automated, there's an opportunity for very mundane but catastrophic failures. Uh, I think that the strength of imitation, like all these examples I gave of computational limitation actually becomes a weakness when the input data already has some bias that we don't want to replicate. You know? So for example, in the United States, uh, there's an automated system that predicts whether a criminal is likely to reoffend after being released uh, from prison. From prison. <laughs> prison. <laughs> Welcome to the United States. <laughs> um, uh, and it turns out it's biased against black people. Uh, because it's been trained on a bunch of data that was already uh, kind of incorporating the institutional bias that exists in the prison system in America. So it's an imitation of ongoing systemic failure, and it's affecting real people right now. It's not involving any super intelligences or killer robots. Um, uh, and if you look at like question answering, um, that's not necessarily going to help you you don't have a diverse group of people working on your question answering product. Like this camera, which is trying to internally answer the question, 
is anyone in this scene blinking, right? You'd think like with image recognition, you should be able to do a good job doing that, but somehow they didn't have anyone on this team that had narrow eyes. So in this photo, it <laughs> uh, becomes clear that it thinks that everyone's blinking. Uh, yeah, and yeah, so all these techniques get really exciting, um, uh, but there's these systemic failures that kind of keep creeping in. Uh, we have these algorithms that can accurately label a lot of images, um, but it's possible for those algorithms to get categories mixed up. Like in this case, uh, Flickr and Google Photos were using the text 8 and Gorilla for photos of black, black people. Um, on the left, that's Flickr. Uh, and then on the right, that's Google Photos. I think just like three weeks later, these news stories were like not very far apart from each other. You'd think Google Photos would have like noticed the first one and made some changes, but it didn't happen. Um, yeah, again, this is just, I'm just kind of repeating the same thing like five times right now, because I think it's really important. Um, yeah, all these failures represent kind of deeper problems that are in society and in engineering, in science. Uh, we don't really hear much from these big companies about like difficult problems that, uh, sorry, we don't hear much from these companies about the mistakes that they're making um, or the kind of questionable things that they're doing. We mostly hear about like Lisa Dole getting beat by DeepMind. Yeah, and if you have some, we're gonna talk about text a little bit later. If you think that your technique is somehow uh, free from bias and free from like dangerous side effects, uh, maybe think twice, like even a really mundane technology like automatic translation can fail. Uh, this was an example I saw last week where WeChat was translating black foreigner into really terrible epithet that's common in America. Um, and uh, there's not a, this is not like a coincidence that I think four of the last six examples or something are basically racism embedded into an application. Um, I think it's one of the longest sta standing social problems. And it makes sense that an algorithm good at imitation would learn to copy the same racism racism that we have socially. Um, anyway, so I'm going to wrap this up, this section about machine intelligence up into questions to keep in mind for people who are doing this kind of stuff. How many people here are more like artists? How many people feel like they're a researcher or engineer? How many people are designers? Yeah. And then performers? Yeah. Musicians? Wow, someone's had their hand in the whole time over there. <laughs> okay, cool. That gives, that's give me an idea. Um, I'm sorry about the people I didn't ask about. <laughs> uh, okay, last section. I'll be quick with this. So I want to give some examples of things that are kind of in between or incorporating aspects of both human and machine intelligence. Hi, I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm calling about an online request you once made about health insurance coverage. Okay. You work with all major companies and compare. Hey, are you a robot? <laughs> what? No, I am a real person. Maybe we have a bad connection. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's crazy. I see you just sound so much like a robot. I am a real person. Maybe we have a bad connection. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Will you tell me you're not a robot? Just say I'm not a robot, please. I am a real person. <laughs> I mean, I believe you, but will you just say, I'm not a robot? That'll make me feel better to hear you say it. <laughs> there is a live person here. But I know there is. It would just make me feel so much better to hear you say, I am not a robot. <laughs> what? If you could yeah. say the word. Okay, so it I'm goes on like this for like four more minutes. <laughs> um, it's complicated. It turns out there is a real person on the other end, uh, but they're, <laughs> instead of speaking for themselves, they're pressing buttons to play recordings. Um, in a way, there's kind of multiple intelligences involved here. It's kind of a composite system that's stretched over time and space. And I think we're going to see more of this in the near future, mixed with things like crowdsourcing and shared identities on social media. This is a picture of what one of the interfaces looks like for people who are using these systems. Um, it's based on research that says someone is more likely to listen to you if you have the same accent as the person that you're calling. 
I think, the, like I said, this line's going to keep getting blurrier. Maybe you recognize this voice. Oops. Ah, oh, audio's out. Okay, you don't need to hear that voice. Um, here's another funny example. Ah, oh, we lost it. No? Oh, we do have it. Great. I'm the voice actor who provided the voice for Siri. <laughs> It's never been in their songs on a design. Opens and dumber than answer. Reply in President's 1 1 by Ro Gomez. That's the Senate by your until top 6 26 9 34 years. So, this is another example of. Uh, this is another example of a computer that doesn't know what to say and is trying to imitate English that was just released last night. Is this still allowed, right? Uh, <laughs> we need some AI here. Uh, so I, I was looking into this idea of like what happens when you have this computational slash uh, human intelligence with this project called Blind Self Portrait in 2012. And uh, we used the human hand as this extension of an otherwise fully automated system. So when the visitor closes their eyes, then this camera that's been looking at them uh, gets fed to a computer vision algorithm that generates a sketch which gets, which gets fed to a robot that they're resting their hand on and forces them to move their hand around in a way that uh, causes them to draw a self-portrait of themselves. <laughs> and it's really kind of uncanny experience. I've never felt used quite that <laughs> way before. The human intelligence in the system is really minimized, and the humans used as a tool of this larger apparatus. You could say the machine's making the decisions, and the humans just following directions, maybe. I think one of our fears of machine intelligence is that it's going to treat us in the worst ways that we treat other people, and there's already an indication that that will continue to happen unless we do something to stop it. <laughs> um, more playful example to finish up with before we go to Alex. Uh, more recently, David Ha. A researcher in San Francisco has been teaching machines to draw using crowdsourced collection of 500 million drawings from a game made by Google called Quick Draw. Uh, this machine learned how humans draw things from lots of examples, and it's able to create new drawings from what it's learned. And in this diagram, he's giving the machine an example drawing on the left, and then asking it to recreate that drawing in different styles. So this end result is. Normally we want to just say, yeah, the machine learns on human data and then it imitates it. But I feel like when you watch this draw or you interact with it and kind of seed it, um, you're involved in a kind of more complex system that's, you know, the machine has learned from humans that is using some starting point from you. And uh, I don't know how to talk about this kind of intelligence right now. Like I feel like we don't even have the right words or metaphors for it. So this is something that we're trying to figure out. And over to you, Alex. So let's hear what you've got. <clears throat> um, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you, Kara, and thank you, Louise, for organizing it. Um, it's a pleasure to have met Kyle. Um, it feels peculiarly like we have many things in common. And I suppose in some ways, maybe the intention was to have slightly different views, <laughs> yes. and yet probably we have much more in common than yeah. um, was intended. Um, I'm a sociologist. Uh, I've been um, studying the sociology of technology for about 15 years, 15, maybe longer than that. Um, and I suppose sociology has this curious or peculiar relationship with AI. It's, it's always come at it with a critical position um, to question what is, what is that, um, the innate quality of, of human intelligence and how a machine could, could never quite achieve that. And I think over the years, um, many sociologists have been proven wrong, um, that they're actually machines are demonstrating all sorts of intelligence. Um, that are showing real value um, in the lives that we live, and you know, every device that we that we own, um, or every computing device that we own now, relies heavily on machine learning and, and AI. 
in a way that, that looks nothing like human intelligence. Um, and to me, that's the space, the curious space of, um, in which we work and operate, the space in which we might start to imagine something else, something beyond human intelligence. And I, I think that's, that's where both Carl and I kind of have an interest, is that for, some, for one reason or another, we're, um, or perhaps predictably, we're entirely obsessed with the idea that we are somehow special on this planet. Um, that we that our intelligences um, supersede everything else, and yet when we look around us and we experience the world and we engage with other kinds of life forms and, and non-human life forms, we realize that actually intelligence can take many forms, and that to me opens up the space for um, AI and machine learning in, in really exciting ways. Um, so I, I wanted to start. Um, with an example from uh, a TV show that, a US TV show, but many of you probably have seen something, either something similar, um, or the show itself, Jeopardy. Um, and in this um, particular episode, they, uh, uh, they've they invited um, an AI, artificial intelligence, Watson, to participate. And it kind of goes as you would imagine it would go. Um, and I won't play it all, um, this entire clip, but um, I'd, I'd just like to invite you to have a think about what kind of intelligence Watson is demonstrating to the audience. Oh. An excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson, what is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson, who is Abbot the Christie? Correct. Same category, 600. At the Olduvai Gorge in 1959, <coughs> she and hubby Lewis found a 1.75 million year old Australopithecus Boise eyed skull. Watson, who is Mary Leakey? You're right. 800, same category. Harriet? <laughs> <laughs> we get the idea. So Watson predictably annihilates the human um, competitors. Um, is our dinner arriving? I'd like to suggest that What's going on there? And we talked a little bit about this on the train, and I think there are different ways you could kind of argue for or against this position. But what we're seeing there is, in some respects, um, the ways in which we are least human, um, the way in which a machine could be designed to be um, that quality in us that is least human. That is to answer a question with a fact or perhaps to play um, a, go, a game like chess, or a game like Go in, the, um, in this recent example of DeepMind winning the Go game. Um, these are highly mechanistic ways in which we demonstrate our intelligence. Um, and yet, the ways that we respond to one another and that we value um, about each, the things that we value about each other exceed that idea of intelligence. You know, we value things not because of the facts that someone can um, reel out to me, but because of the ways that people respond to me emotionally, effectively. And to me, um, so much of the work in AI is all about that kind of, how do we reduce the idea of human intelligence to something that a machine might replicate? rather than how do we expand the idea of intelligence to think what could a machine do that could be part of these, um, these mutual enactments of intelligence, the ways in which we become intelligent together. So I want to show um, a very different version of intelligence here, and this really is about um, an intelligence um, that becomes through a relationship. One of, the, one of my own interests is in animal studies um, and how animals are able to demonstrate incredible feats of intelligence. 
And um, one only needs to go and hang out on YouTube for a little bit to find out that there's tons of this stuff. So this is just <laughs> one example. Um, there's, there is audio to this, but it, I think we're going to turn it down. But it, it, it kind of just watch and enjoy. <laughs> so there's something going on there. You know, we don't. I don't. We don't have access to. Of course, we can't ask questions about um, what each of these species is doing or demonstrating. But there's clearly some kind of um, mimicking going on. The goat or sheep is debatable as to whether which animal it is is trying to show the rhino how to jump. Um, and <laughs> it's a collective activity. It's an activity <laughs> that, um, that contests so many ideas of what we would argue is um, animal intelligence. And there's, a, there's this long history um, of an idea of um, animals having an intelligence that's tied or bound to their biological state. Um, and, and often this is um, based on the idea of brain size to weight ratio. Um, and there are so many ways in which this gets uh, rehearsed and, re and represented. And, and it, when I say it now, I just think how ridiculous that idea sounds. And yet there's a paper from 2011, and there are probably many more since then, in which this idea that somehow a, a singular a notion of intelligence is bound to, to what brain size to weight is what is indicative of us. You know, how many kinds of intelligence does that immediately start to eliminate? Um, so I've got 10 minutes. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut some of these videos short, but we've got, we found uh, a whole bunch of other. Um, Nice examples from YouTube and the web about animal intelligence. Let's at least run it. Um, and I, I suppose the point to make here is that when one pays attention, when one um, applies a sense of care to observing the world, we see repeatedly that animals um, and animals across species as well as uh, within species exceed their capacities that we would define as what animals are capable of. And here we see some elephants managing to coordinate their activities around um, controlling uh, this plank of wood here. So if they pull it together, they get the reward. If they pull it separately, it um, it won't ever get closer to them. And so very quickly, they, these elephants learn that they can coordinate their actions to actually pull this rope um, in a coordinated fashion. Um, there's another example here. Uh, actually, I'm going to skip this. But if, if you are interested in animals, um, please come and talk to us later, and we can kind of point you in the right direction. Dolphins are ridiculous. That's, that's the moral yeah. of the story. <laughs> um, so, my own work has been about um, uh, studying people in context, um, in real world context, and also introducing technologies into those contexts. Uh, and to think about how intelligence gets um, performed, if you will. So it's not something that's innately in us, but it's something that's enacted through the, the things that we do. So I'm going to show a three-minute video um, from some fieldwork that I've done with uh, a number of other colleagues of um, families in cars. Um, and in this case, this is a school run in which um, Chloe, the young girl, travels with her um, family every day. She knows the route. The route's the same every day, and the end point, obviously, is the same every day. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
found his, his, his little cup when he did this booze and wings. I think they'll do that. No, no, they have. They have like cats do that. Little trains. That's cats, not dogs. Oh man, what do dogs do? Yeah, don't go outside. You have to pick up a plastic bag. Well, if we did. You can't even take out a hamster when you're going to manage to do that at all. I'm just saying, if! Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. And, and in the night time, when I'm asleep, you just come up and cuddle me. And lick me and cuddle me. You have your bonkers, that's what my job is to do. No, no, not lick me in the morning. No, their daddies are so good in the morning to go. It's a, and you jump over and you go, oh, go away, you put the tubs over your head like you do when I go in. My, my he would cuddle me and everything. Because he was really furry. In that noise, it was just going about to cuddle people. Mm -hmm. well, they wouldn't, they get all excited about it when they see you and they hit you. They yeah, they but if they did. What about a puppy? Puppies are just not only do they nibble and lick you, they're probably wee all over your bed as well, so they get so wee when they get excited. Do you remember uh, the smallest one? He wheezed all the time so he was called what do you call it? Is that my set please? And one no, I wouldn't see because you have to be quite lucky with your... No, that was the one that... Puddle, you Yeah, he used to do wings all the time. And he did one on a newspaper. Mm -hmm. Well, you can do that with your dog. Sorry, a bit late this morning. So, <laughs> there are so many things to be said about that video, um, but I, I think that the thing that I want to concentrate on in the next couple of minutes is to ask that question, where, is, where does intelligence reside here? Um, because Chloe has timed this exquisitely. Um, this is the school run in which she knows that route, she gradually works up that question, that final question, mommy, why can't we get a dog? Through a series of um, questions and discussion. She doesn't want the answer to this question. This is a war of attrition in which um, the time honored uh, question of a young child asking their parent, can we get a pet? is being rehearsed and repeated again and again, and it will be repeated in some other situation. But what's interesting is that it's, it's done in a car. Um, there's no escape from this environment. Her mother's not going anywhere. The sequence of events unfolds the same way every day, and so Chloe knows that there's that temporal quality to this. The, the intelligence, if you will, is spread across the geographical and temporal organization of things and people in space. It's not within a person. And this is what I would call an enactment of intelligence, that we do things and we become intelligent through the environments that we're in and that we live through. Um, so I, I want to just quickly, and this, these are my last couple of slides before the fruit arrives, and we give you your first challenge. Um, talk about some objects that, that I've built with a, a number of colleagues um, in which we sort of started from this idea that, and again, this is something Carl and I, that came up in a discussion we've had earlier, um, that we seem very comfortable talking about things as though they have some effectual quality to them, um, that they're happy, that they're sad, that they're clever, that they're stupid. Um, and yet, um, when we're asked about them at some kind of, in an academic way, we're, we're like, oh, of course, the things can't have intelligence, things can't have agency. And so the question was to think, well, what would we, how, how might we sort of start to build um, seemingly inanimate objects? So they start to evoke that kind of thinking, start to evoke maybe objects of curiosity, intelligence. And so um, a number of these, um, uh, objects uh, have 
simple code in them, but uh, responsive. They have sensors in them, and they respond to the environment and start to build up relationships um, with their owners. So we we put three devices um, that we called rudiments into people's homes, and we left them there for about a month at a time um, just to get that people's reactions. And I just want to show you a couple of um, video clips of what people said about them. It's very noisy. It's been banished to the other room. Uh, so, much movement and all the articulation actually is behaved like he's drumming. But I like the idea of the uh, of the Bobby <laughs> because because he, because he was like fall down all the time before and a friend of us came. Actually, we didn't give the name. It's a friend of us who gave the name. It was not. Yeah, it was not. Dobby, coming from Dobby Talk. Dobby Talk. I mean, Dobby Talk means a little bit like dumb, <laughs> but it's funny, it's funny. And um, oh, we like very much the idea that actually he's the guardian of the food. Because he's there, yeah. Because we put the food there and we said, okay, now take care of the food. <laughs> this one, which we haven't really talked about. It. Yeah. Um, it's get that's getting to the point where it's starting to be a bit more interesting because whether it's real or imagined, when it looked at me, when whether that was that was it really recognises me or not, I don't know. But it tended towards blueness, which is quite cute. Everyone is enjoying it. The coming, yeah. it's coming in because it's one of the, maybe the shape yeah. of, the, of the curves and. People are coming and we are starting to say, now this one is going to show you the color and because it's moving. And they were like, mm, oh, hey, oh, I hear it. What color I hear? Mm -hmm. So, if so yeah. going to be completely functionless, then it has to be, it has to engage you with that at another level. It's that interaction, isn't it? It's something that can actually yeah. with the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Something which, which appears to be. To have some irritations, but it's entirely pointless. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. then, why would I have a dog robot if I have a dog? Because I think you'd have to be a discussion about improving or replacing. And really, yeah. I'm not about improving or replacing. There's something new. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're back in action. Let's do this. Woo! <laughs> I might still eat a little more of this, just as a warning. <laughs> um, okay, so we actually had a challenge number two after this, but I think we're gonna drop it in favor of having more like Q&A uh, at the end, um, because we don't have as much time as we were thinking we would have, or maybe we have too much to say, <laughs> a little bit of both. Um, but we do wanna hear your answers to this one. So who's got some kind of example in response to our first challenge? Just raise your hand and we'll, we'll make you stand up. Go ahead. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Well, we have a couple of ideas. Um, one of them was Amazon Echo and the way mm. that kids use it to order stuff from their parents' account. Mm. That they wake up in the morning and they come back to it. The other thing I think you should say then, one about the. Oh, we got two, I think, <clears throat> similar ideas about uh, the uh, eight ball and uh, oh, the lottery, yeah. so randomness, mm. exactly. Uh, point. And, uh, whenever there's a the water, I think uh, a lot of very intelligent ideas about randomness and, and probabilities come up, mm. and the way that mm. it's resetting and everywhere kind of goes into what is probabilistic and what's not. So That's a nice one. Any others from the questions? Um, just going kind of carrying on from that, I'm always quite interested by that whole news story from a couple of years, years ago about Spotify having to change their shuffle algorithm mm. because um, they were getting a lot of complaints from users that it would bring up you know, two tracks by the same artist. Yeah. <laughs> how, how can it be random if it's doing that? Yeah. And so this, then having to effectively dumb down the randomness algorithm in order to compensate for humans' inability to understand what random means. That's a good example. That's a really good example. I remember when the um, iPod first came out, that was one of the first like you know real shuffle yeah. devices that everyone had, and there were people making the same complaints like it's not random. There's something going on. You know, it knows who I was just talking to a minute ago, and it turns out that like there's actually a lot of ways that we see intelligence in other systems. That, uh, for example, like animators really understand this well. That uh, there's people from Disney that have been studying this for a long time, and they've put out books and movies and whatever, all based on, you know, what are the things that make uh, cartoons look alive? Like, what is it that gives things a feeling of life? And it's about how they stretch and squash and how they bounce and how they move. And um, when it doesn't have those qualities, it doesn't seem alive. I think randomness can often feel like one of those qualities that's important to feeling alive or intelligent. Any other, any other responses to the challenge? Yeah. Just, um, talking about bacteria. Mm. Um, and bacteria isn't necessarily uh, on the internet, but it has an entropic mm -hmm. intelligence. Mm -hmm. And um, conversely, you can hear humans always kind of looking for feeling and disconnect our intellect. Um, and we're chasing that kind of energy. <laughs> yeah, there's a similar one talking to somebody here about um, the bio, sort of interested in the human bio. Like, um, well, all over, it's oh, not all just the gut, but all the bacteria that are inside us, and how that, he, he was saying that in, intelligence or consciousness, not so much intelligence, consciousness, doesn't necessarily live in the brain, it potentially lives in the bio. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a common one about the, the mites or the bug that, that tells a cat to do things that aren't benefit of the cat, but right. the benefit of the, of the, of the bug. Yeah. Um, yes. So there's that sort of, you know, uh, there's some sort of, I, I, I'm a massive cognitivist, so I don't know what intelligence means. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever you want to think about consciousness stage, okay. it, yeah. it does it manifest itself in, in the strangest of places. I, th I think the, um, 
cell life and biological life is a really nice way to start thinking in this space because it, as Kyle said earlier on, this kind of human urge to, to classify and categorize has got us into a lot of trouble with biology because we are so restricted in how we classify entities. Um, and yet um, there's been some recent kind of results in biology to show this kind of cross pollination to the sort of analogy but of um, living entities that um, the idea of um, single entities living and cell lives living by themselves and expanding and grow, it, it just doesn't um, capture the real kind of way in which biology evolves and expands um, and likewise it's the same argument with intelligence it's just we're, we're so insistent on these classifications of intelligence I and mean, yet when we kind of see things differently, kind of come at it in a different way, we see intelligence being something very different. And I think this thing you were just saying about not knowing what intelligence is, I think that's uh, exactly that's, what we were trying yeah, to get at with these yeah. questions. <laughs> so hopefully, after answering these questions, you know less what intelligence <laughs> is, yeah. and uh, we're all on the same page. So we've started from a blank <laughs> slate, now we'll continue. <laughs> Um, we wanted to give some examples of like applications of machine learning, besides the ones that I, I already gave a few, but we wanted to give a few more um, as uh, to like kind of give you another challenge. Uh, but I think what we should do is just go through it really quickly, leave you with the question, not do it as a group right now, but just something for you to think about after this. Uh, so I'm going to give a few examples of uh, face detection, tracking, recognition, and expression analysis. Uh, face detection is something we're all pretty familiar with. It basically figures out where or if a face is in an image. It's been around for a long time. Um, the algorithm that we use now, I think it's from the 80s originally, but face recognition or identifying who a picture of a face is a picture of has been around since the late 60s, um, developed in the US originally uh, for the CIA. Actually, under um, uh, <laughs> under like a fake CIA organization that wasn't really revealed as being part of the CIA <laughs> until like a few years ago. So, uh, yeah, this is what it looks like when face detection is running. So, whenever you pull up your phone and point it at your face, and it draws a little green box around your face, it's doing this whole thing once every frame, scanning across the entire image, and it's checking to see what the relationships of dark to light areas are in that box. And then basically asking and answering a bunch of questions really quickly to say, how does this area compare to that area? Okay, how does this area compare to that area? Okay, how does this area compare to that area? Oh, doesn't look like a face. Next, da 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 yeah, A little bit like a face, da 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 a little bit like a face. And then it compiles these kind of results together. Once you've got a face in an image, then you can kind of store it in a database. This is actually a picture from, I think, 2001, before 9-11, uh, in this uh, summer, there's the Super Bowl where we play American football, and everyone gets really excited about it. Um, and uh, they basically deployed a face recognition system to try and see if there were any criminals coming to the Super Bowl game without telling anybody that they were doing this. And uh, ACLU, uh, which is like a civil rights organization in the US, kind of erupted in um, pure about them having done this. And there's a lot of really interesting articles from that time that are like think pieces about what face recognition is going to mean 10 years from now, and it's all come true. And there are people like trying to stop this at that moment, and they just failed completely. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that was a little dark. Uh, face tracking looks like this. This is where you have um, not just a box around your face, and it's not trying to figure out who you are, it's uh, trying to track all the different landmarks on your face. Things like your jaw and your nose and your eyes and your eyebrows. Um, this is useful as like a first step for kind of higher level analysis a lot of the time. Things like expression recognition and something else called frontalization where you take someone's picture from the side and you can kind of convert it to like a picture from the front. This is an uh, essential part of what happens when you're doing like face swapping. And this is a researcher named Jason Saragi, who I worked with a few years ago to port his code to FaceOSC, that app that I showed you. And this is him again, 
he was doing some uh, expression recognition for the U.S. government, actually. Uh, actually, I don't know if I can say that publicly, but <laughs> now it's out there. Uh, this was a while ago. This was 2014 or 13, and uh, he was trying to train an algorithm to understand what different expressions we make look like. And, oh, did it play the video? Yeah. Oh, it just played once. Um, and you can see, like, when he smiles, the kind of green joy meter goes up. Um, this product is actually, sorry, this uh, technique is actually built into a lot of places these days. Um, there's billboards that have cameras built into them on the street that are doing yeah, this kind of analysis. The, the, uh, one on the street section? Yeah. Has this. Um, they, they, don't, they just saw the map they get from it, and then saw any video, just saw this. Hmm. Wow. That's, uh, I'm not you surprised. You got scammed by it. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, okay. No. <laughs> um, if you want to look more into this, there's a company called Kairos that is doing this uh, and providing it like as ad tech to people. And um, they're a really interesting company because um, their presence on social media is really like kind of thoughtful and critical, but they're still complicit in this huge system. Um, you can also generate faces. This was some... This is some research from uh, just last week, actually, showing what it looks like when a computer, uh, when, a, when a deep neural net dreams up new faces based on a big collection of images of celebrities. So they trained uh, this neural net with a bunch of celebrity photos and then asked it to invent new celebrity faces. Okay, and then Alex has some examples of text. Um, so, uh, I guess one of the things I wanted to say was I, um, prior to work, I work at City University in London. Prior to that, I was working at Microsoft uh, for about 12, 13 years. And one of the big things at Microsoft in, this is in Cambridge, UK, um, is machine learning. Um, and so I, one of the areas of research that I was involved in was looking at natural language processing. So talking to machines such as like Siri or Amazon Echo. Um, let's get this example. Um, actually, uh, Siri and Amazon uh, and Microsoft's Cortana are pretty old school machine learning. Um, it's a pretty um, simple question answer um, interaction with a machine. Of course, it's pretty sophisticated in the sense that it can understand speech, but it's just parsing a question and giving you a slot as an answer. So you, what time is it? Two o'clock, that's the slot. And you can, it, you can imagine that that can get increasingly more sophisticated. So now we can um, say, remind me when I get home of X or Y or Z. So it's obviously deploying other kinds of um, sensors in the environment, such as the location sensor on your phone. So I think what's nice about that is even though it's quite an, uh, um, a, an established approach to uh, language recognition and machine learning, you, you start to see how something reasonably sophisticated can happen. Um, and I'm, I'm still amazed that my um, iPhone will remind me when I get somewhere. It's quite a nice kind of thing. Um, what uh, Kyle's kind of mentioned a few times, uh, neural nets or deep neural nets or deep learning, as it's often referred to, um, again, is quite an old idea in machine learning and AI, but it's seen this um, kind of resurgence. Um, and really, that comes down to data. And I'm sure many of you have already kind of come across coverage of this in, in various news and, and academic sites. but. The prevalence and the production of data is what is allowing um, this resurgence of neural nets um, as an approach to um, creating intelligence in machines. And um, I mean, I think this is one of the things that we might ask ourselves: is um, is statistical probability, um, as we as you, as you mentioned, um, somehow correlated with or synonymous with intelligence? It's a question. Um, 
but certainly neural nets um, are deeply associated with probability. Uh, what, what makes them distinct is that if you try to um, understand probability of something happening, of a complex setting, um, of something happening within a complex setting, it'd probably be near, near impossible to do that with a computer because of all the, the many permutations. Neural nets break things down into layers, and so you get these sort of multi-dimensional models um, in which um, the probability can kind of be estimated at different, um, different layers. And so you get these very complex layers in which we, no human can possibly understand what um, the AI is doing, and that's where a lot of the controversy with artificial current artificial intelligence is. You cannot understand why a machine is, is doing what it's doing. So I, really, I, really, I just wanted to kind of talk through briefly um, how language is understood um, using neural networks. And they, these, are, these graphs belie the complexity, but if we kind of just um, think through them, um, it, it might help us. So if you imagine that you have a data corpus um, of people speaking, and you uh, think about the order in which things are said. Um, and so you might have people greeting each other. And you very quickly see that there are certain words that get said at certain stages of talk. And that those words might indeed be interchangeable. So names. So hi, my name is Alex. And that might be Kyle, etc. So the machine starts to see that there's a probability associated with those particular words. They doesn't know that they're names, it just thinks actually after a sequence of two words, often a name or this Kyle Alex category starts to emerge. And so you start to see groupings and um, in this graph, look at the bottom left hand corner, you see that countries are starting to appear roughly in the same segment um, of the graph. And you see that countries are not too far away from things like unions and administrations. And so what's interesting about this is the, the AI knows nothing about the meaning of these entities, but through plotting their, their likelihood of occurring within a spoken sequence, it starts to be able to group the meaningful uh, entities as meaningful objects. And meaning falls out almost as a byproduct of probability. And that becomes an incredibly powerful way to uh, model speech and produce speech. And you can take that to another level in which you not, not only are you using a word, you're using a sequence of words. And so statements become objects in themselves in which we can start to think that some statements are like other kinds of statements. So a century again, bottom left hand corner, a century ago and half a century ago, start to feel like the same sort of parameter of time. Um, and but just because of the way that, that they get used in talk. And you can, now you can start to understand why you need so much data to be able to do this. You know, to be, to be able to classify types of talk of this kind, um, you need vast amounts of, um, of data that, so Facebook becomes a very, um, powerful way in which to generate this kind of language recognition because think how many conversations occur on um, Facebook Messenger, Messenger, for example. So Google, because yeah. Google's crack parents, I think it gives people physical reasons to not be saying something through, I don't know if that's true, but it, would that be a way from gathering information as well? Yeah. It would be how they speak. Yes. So, that would so, be a great way to gather information, but uh, I'm pretty sure that no one's doing that right okay. now. So no one's like listening to microphones to talk. except for the government. Like they yeah. sometimes have things in places, uh, or they're listening to phone conversations sometimes. Like in the U.S., it's very common. But uh, uh, it's more like looking at posts on Facebook or looking at emails. Like who looks at emails? Um, so things that you digitize yourself are definitely going to be. And there's a fear that Amazon Echo, for example, might be used in that way. And it's especially unclear with Amazon Echo because uh, with most of these technologies, like if I'm saying something right now around my phone, uh, there's ways to check if my phone is sending something to a server or not, right? Uh, but with something like Amazon Echo, it's probably 
plugged in all the time and always sending something. So figuring out what it's sending and is it speech or is it something else is a lot more complicated. There's another question. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. So, uh, without before you'd said that, um, I would say that the likelihood of it being um, canned, if you will, it was very high. I suppose I, the, what I would add to that is there is probably some um, deep learning going on in the sense that there's a range of canned answers to which you could respond to um, a swear word. And that's the kind of level at which something like Siri is working. Um, this kind of um, uh, machine learning with natural language processing isn't generally within um, the kinds of technologies that we use. There are some exceptions. I'm going to talk about one that is relevant to, to things like swear words now. And this is, this is the last slide in this section because we should get a move on. Yeah. Um, so many of you will have, well, at least some of you will have heard about Tay AI, which is a Microsoft um, chatbot uh, released on Twitter and within 24 hours was taken down um, <laughs> bec because of its um, expression of hate speech, um, an incredibly violent um, hate speech to the point, obviously, where it was a, a PR debacle and, and Microsoft had to back off um, this, very, this very strong vision of um, neural network based language bots, but now has been reincarnated in, in Zoe. We talked about Zoe um, is, a, is a current Microsoft bot. What, what's important um, about Tay AI is the criticism that was immediately um, uh, applied to Tay was why didn't you use the blacklist? Um, and the blacklist something a bit like this, which is just a hard-coded list of words that you never um, respond to and never repeat in a chatbot. Um, the problem with a black blacklist like this is um, if you said Pakistan, that word would not be repeated by a bot because um, a substring of Pakistan is Paki, and Paki is on um, the blacklist. It's an incredibly crude um, response to hate speech and racist talk that belies the p potential um, creativity and intelligence of a, of a neural net. It's a, it's a fail safe to respond to something that we don't know how to respond to. Um, and so, like Siri responding to a swear word, um, there, there tend to be layers in which the responses occur. So they might be humorous, and then it might be, don't say that again. And the third might be, I'm not talking to you for another half hour. And the final one is, you're blocked. And that's what kind of happens on, in these bot spaces now. Um, I suppose what interests me is, how might we apply neural nets, not just to kind of a conversation, but to really trying to handle things like hate speech beyond just this very crude mechanism of the blacklist. And that's a, a kind of working space that I'm currently involved in now, is to really harness some of these kind of the strengths and values of, of AI to do something a bit, a bit more sophisticated. So the challenge we are going to give you, and this is something to think about, is we wanted you to imagine the worst possible application you could think of for any of the technologies that we've discussed and present it to us as a movie trailer. <laughs> and we had this great uh, chunk we were going to play of this guy who just says, oh god, I just have to play one of this. It's just too good. Yeah. This is the guy. Like, he, I don't know if you've heard this. In a time of tradition, in a city where anything can happen in a world that isn't his, every day in the world. 
City, the Miami Police Force, in the deep south from the sewers of God. So we were going to ask you to give us that version of what, you know, worst possible <laughs> application. Uh, anyway, we're going to keep going and finish up with section three, the good, the good news. Um, <laughs> the good news is many of these algorithms are making it into the hands of the public. Um, this isn't just trapped in academia. That's actually been uh, uh, deep learning specifically has been incredibly democratic from the beginning uh, because it was kind of an outsider art for a long time. The people who were developing it most uh, seriously were working on it for decades until it was successful. And that meant that they had to share it really publicly and find support for it uh, and demonstrate their results in a very public way. So there's a kind of attitude around a lot of these new technologies of like sharing them openly, not keeping them inside companies. So in this example, uh, the image at the bottom left is generated by the original painting at the top, plus the doodles on the top right and the uh, lower bo uh, bottom right. Um, the top one uh, kind of marks up the original, so it's a description of what's at the top left. And then the bottom right one is sort of what you want to see. Um, this was released uh, last year by a researcher, Alex Champenar, um, and got like a, a few hours to figure out how to compile code, then you can go to his website and download the code and try and run it. Um, some of these apps, or some of these techniques even end up like in app stores, like Artisto or Prisma, they do this style transfer thing I was showing earlier. Um, and other people are more like at the intersection of the research and the arts, like I'm doing some of these projects in the middle sometimes, like this one's called Terra Pattern. It's an open source tool for similar image search with satellite imagery um, to find kind of patterns of interest and democratize geospatial intelligence. Um, it's good for finding non-building structures and other stuff that's not usually marked on a map. Uh, when we first threw a neural net at it, it didn't do what we needed it to do exactly. Um, <laughs> If you, if you run a normal object detector across the earth looking for objects, then you know you get things like umbrellas and toilet seats. But um, once you train it for like satellite imagery, then you can start to find things like container yards or uh, golf course sand traps or uh, rusting oil tanks. And this might look kind of mundane at first, but it, it's actually helpful for answering certain questions that you need a kind of combination of like human intelligence and machine intelligence, like uh, monitoring the Amazon project is, uh, um, this is a photo from uh, some researchers who are working to monitor uh, illegal logging trails uh, that are uh, used for, uh, that result in deforestation throughout the Amazon. Um, or there's other researchers using satellite imagery to track penguins across, across Antarctica. Um, you might wonder where are the penguins in this image, and they're almost impossible to see, but what you can see is all that brown stuff. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how you track penguins. <laughs> it turns out their diets are actually encoded uh, in, in that brown stuff. So uh, you can track bigger stuff too, like uh, southern right whales, which are endangered species, uh, but from satellite imagery, you can identify these blobs using machine learning. You can imagine like a human can't go through the entire ocean and look for these creatures, but when you have a computer, you've got a little more power. So I, um, I wanted to wrap up by saying uh, that I feel like even as we're reflecting on our fears and failures of machine learning, I don't want to just uh, enc encourage this image of the future where machine intelligence is responsible for this omnipresent dystopia. I think that it's possible to design algorithms to help improve our understanding of each other and our relationships. Um, I'm not just a tech solutionist or anti-technology, um, but I think that there's something in both of those perspectives. I think that machines have the potential to sift through a lot of information to help us understand things uh, about the world that are at a bigger scale than we can understand, and also to just help us see things that are maybe more subtle than we can pick up on usually. So I, want, I just want to show this project from 2013. I installed in Korea and Japan. Uh, I, I used some face tracking, which I showed some examples of how face tracking works earlier. Uh, 
uh, use face tracking, some computer vision and machine learning to help people find a connection across borders, kind of find a pattern in this data that might be bigger than what you can find as an individual person. I guess the thing that I, the, the things I was going to cover were some, some, some of my own work where I feel like I'm experimenting with the possibilities of AI and technology. Um, and I think Kyle's work obviously really speaks to that too. And that, um, you know, AI and machine learning invite so many kind of dystopic, dystopic visions of what what the world might be like. Maybe what we should be doing is just trying to throw as many forms of experimentation um, at worlds that we would want to be in, the worlds that we would want to, to live in. And I, I just like this, this quote from, from Nigel Thrift that invites this, this more space, more room. And I think you know, AI is, is, a, is an infrastructure that, that might give us the way to expand the room in which we start to think about new possibilities or new worlds that we might live in. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>